Good evening. This morning we found ourselves beginning a series in the uh, book of Matthew, in particular the Sermon on the Mount, and that is going to be a Sunday evening series. I just chose to uh, present the first of those lessons this morning, and so I appreciate you being here to study with us. We've been reading through the New Testament as a congregation, and by and large we've been uh, addressing some of those topics in our Sunday morning hour. We're going to do that for the next several weeks here on Sunday evenings here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What I suggested to you this morning has been the greatest sermon ever preached and the greatest sermon in the Christian age. And that is because it was preached by Jesus and it's so comprehensive. And the overall message, and let me just say this, though it is a repeat of some of what was said this morning, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry we see that John the Baptist came baptizing and preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus came along right after him preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in the midst of Jesus' ministry, He said, I will establish my church, which is my kingdom. And He promised to do that, giving Peter the keys of the kingdom. And at the end of the ministry of Jesus, when He was uh, killed, buried, and was resurrected, for that 40-day period of time, He walked about in His resurrected body proclaiming what message? that the kingdom of God is coming, and it's coming soon. I believe that the Bible is correct when it states that the kingdom came in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. We call the kingdom the church. Sometimes we call it the body, the family of God, the bride of Christ. But we, if we are Christians, we have been added to the body of Christ. We are citizens of the kingdom. And when Christ came preparing the people for the kingdom, He had this grand sermon we call the Sermon on the Mount. And there's so many wonderful themes that are touched on in this sermon, so beautifully spoken and written down for us. This morning we talked about how He started off that sermon with the Beatitudes. If you're going to be citizens in my kingdom, here is the character you should develop in order to be citizens in my kingdom. And if you remember the end of that discussion, we saw in verse number 11, go back and read with me in Matthew 5, verse number 11. The end of that discussion this morning, he said, you are blessed when they, or go back to verse 10, blessed are those who are what? What's it say? persecuted. Verse 11, you are blessed when they insult you or revile you and persecute you and uh, falsely say every kind of evil thing against you because of me for my name's sake. Notice verse number 12. He says, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before me. And I may add, that's how they also persecuted him. Now, without getting into this morning's lesson in too uh, much depth, uh, if the prophets of old were persecuted, and Jesus Christ was persecuted, and the apostles and early disciples were persecuted, what should we expect? We should expect to be persecuted. Now, it's interesting that that first lesson in the Sermon on the Mount deals with the type of character that we as citizens in the kingdom are to have, right? Right? And then he ends that discussion by saying, here's how the world will treat you. This is how the world will view you as someone to be persecuted. But in the next section, and you already know what that is in verses 13 through 16, what I want to talk to you this evening, he says, here's how you respond to the world. You don't persecute them back. You don't develop an army and wage war against them. You don't do that like with the Crusades. Instead, the way the world will treat you as citizens in the kingdom is persecution. And the way you are to interact with the world is to be the salt of the earth and to be what else? The light of the world. That's the two points I want to talk with you about very briefly this evening. And so he talks about the influence of those who are citizens of the kingdom. He says, you're citizens of the kingdom. If you're following me and here's what your character looks like, and now that you know your citizens in the kingdom, the church, the body of Christ, here's what he says next. Here's how you are to influence the world. Now let's just begin in our study by looking at point number one in verse 13. He comes right out and says it as a matter of fact. It's, it's a metaphor, no doubt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And we can stand here and, and together discuss the purpose of salt. 
the primary purpose for salt in my life is to add flavor to whatever it is. Now, I know there are those in this assembly whose doctor has told you to cut back on the salt. So the last thing I want to do is stand here and remind you how good salt tastes. I love mashed potatoes. I love fried potatoes. I love potatoes of all kinds. But have you ever tried to eat mashed potatoes without salt? I mean, if you have to do that because of doctor's orders, I'm really not trying to be mean to you by talking about it this evening. But I really don't like eating mashed potatoes without just a little bit of salt and a whole lot of pepper. But there's other things that this applies to as well. Salt primarily in my life is a way of enhancing the flavor of something, adding flavor to things. But in times past, before refrigeration came into play, what was another extremely important role of salt? It was, it was a preserving agent, that's right. And many of the foods that many of us still like today are carried over from older traditions. You know, I, when I eat ham... I mean, I like ham of all sorts, but the way I grew up, it's got to be country ham. And what distinguishes country ham from the rest of it? It's extremely salty. And, uh, and so the, the idea of salt has never changed. The physical qualities of salt, of course, is that a lot of times it's white, sometimes it's pink, but overall it enhances flavor and it preserves. Uh, based on this context, I think what is primarily under consideration here is he's wanting, to sh he's wanting us to remember uh, that salt has an enhancing quality. It enhances flavors. And I think we see that in the text. Notice the statement of Jesus. He says, but if the salt loses its flavor... So when Jesus decides in this sermon to use salt as a metaphor, I believe the primary point he's making is that salt adds flavor to something. Now, when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what in essence is he saying? He's saying this world is dark and mean and ugly and sinful and corrupt. We can't deny that, can we? But because this world is dark and evil and sinful and corrupt, he says there is something that adds flavor to this world that allows God to look down upon this world and it's a little more tolerable to him. And that is citizens of the kingdom of God. Now we could develop this further, but I would just note that when we look in our Bibles at Genesis chapter 18 and Jeremiah chapter 5 and a host of other passages, it is clear for us to see that, that a fateful remnant or a fateful few have often overall enhanced the flavor of the entire nation of Israel, for instance. You may recall in Genesis chapter 18, God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, that area over there where your nephew Lot is living, Sodom and Gomorrah, they've grown corrupt and they've grown evil and I've come down to destroy those cities. It was two principal cities with ten smaller habitations around it. I've come down to destroy destroy those cities. And you remember the conversation that Abraham and God engage in. Well, well, Lord, if there's 50 righteous souls in the city, will you destroy the city? And what was God's response? No. You see, if there was only faithful righteous souls, they would have been salt to the cities. They would have enhanced the cities. It would have been more tolerable for God and he wouldn't feel as though he had to destroy the cities for 50 righteous souls. He goes down. And depending on the uh, original text you're using, but by and large he goes down in increments of 10, sometimes 5. How about 45? How about 35? How about 20? How about 10? And I want you to notice that God agrees with Abraham that if there are only ten righteous souls in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, that I will not destroy the cities. Now, I think, I don't know, but I think possibly what Abraham was thinking was, I know more than ten people living in those cities. I know Lot and his wife and all of his children. That's more than ten. Surely that's enough to get the job done. But not even Lot's entire family was righteous. Even those that were still in his household, him, his wife, and his two daughters, even his wife turned back. And, and we could study that in more detail, but she was turned into what? A pillar of salt. And so that's one example. Hold your place here in Matthew chapter 5 and go with me to Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse number 1. And here in Jeremiah, what's specifically being addressed is God 
who's going to bring judgment on the city of Jerusalem. And I want you to notice what God says regarding bringing destruction or punishment on the city of Jerusalem in this case. This is not the same instance as is spoken of in Matthew 24, for instance, later in A.D. 70. But in uh, Jeremiah 5 and verse number 1, he says, "...roam through the streets of Jerusalem." investigate, search in her squares, underline it, if you find one person, any who acts justly, who pursues faithfulness, what's he say? Then I will forgive her, that is the city. And so in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, if there was ten righteous souls, that would have been enough salt in order to make those cities tolerable and survive. And in the case of Jerusalem in Jeremiah 5, if there was just one righteous soul, then God would spare the city and forgive her. And we could see this, through, this pattern throughout the Old Testament, how when there was vast apostasy, there was usually a fateful remnant, and God makes it clear the reason you're still standing as a society is because I have a few fateful people left. And because of them, you're still standing. Do you think that principle could possibly apply even to our great nation that we live in? You know, when God looked down on the generation of Noah's day and He said it is corrupt, He said in Genesis 1, Behold, it is very good. And then some years later, He sees that man and his sinfulness corrupts the earth and He destroys all earth with the flood, of course. He says it's corrupt, it's ruined. We know that He saved Noah and his family because Noah was righteous. And so, I don't want to belabor the point more than it is, but I think the point is seen that when Christ says here regarding his kingdom, don't forget that you will be have influence in the world and actually you as Christians, you as followers of Christ, you as citizens in the kingdom give salt to a rather tasteless earth when it comes to the overall picture. Jesus warns against losing our flavoring ability. You see that there in the text. I think it's interesting when you talk about salt in and of itself, I'm talking about actual salt, it's not known to lose its flavor. That's interesting. Now, I could be wrong about some unique circumstances, but generally speaking, to my knowledge, it's not known to lose its flavor. But regarding the only way salt can lose its flavor is if it is diluted or if it has impurities mixed in it. Therefore, it loses its ability to enhance flavor. And I think it's interesting in light of what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 when he says evil companionship corrupts good morals or corrupts good habits or behavior. And that is that we are the salt of the world if we're children of God. But can there be things or people that come into our lives and dilute our ability to enhance the flavor of this earthly existence? Can that happen? Actually, we know that it can happen because of various passages. You know, Jesus said also in this Sermon on the Mount that we are not to love money. Now, He didn't say it quite that way, but He says your treasure is where your, or your heart will be where your treasure is and vice versa. And He says, do not lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But what's He say, church family? Lay your treasure up where? In heaven. And so he talks about this, many of these things linked together in this discussion. And so if we lose our flavor, uh, how are we going to be seasoned? Uh, that is the impurities of this life. We will be thrown out, the Bible says. You see that there in the text? Read again verse number 12, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste or flavor, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus implying here that we can go from being citizens of the kingdom, children of God, saved from our sins... Is he implying that we can go from there to losing all of it with unfaithfulness? Is he implying that we can fall from grace? I believe probably so. Uh, go with me to Matthew. Let's just, yeah, let's go to Matthew chapter 13 since it's here in the book of Matthew. And I want us to observe what Jesus says later in verse number 40. Matthew 13 verse number 40. This is Jesus giving His interpretation or the meaning, if you will, of the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the weeds, however you want to word it. 
And I want you to notice, beginning in verse number 40 of this parable, Jesus says, Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Verse 41, The Son of Man will send out His angels, His messengers, and they will gather from His kingdom. They will gather from where? His kingdom. What is the kingdom? The body, the family of God, the church, the location of the saved. They will gather from His kingdom all who call sin and those guilty of lawlessness. So you're telling me there are those who are initially citizens of the kingdom and at the end of time they will be lost. Keep reading. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there, verse 44, 42, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears hear or listen. Going back to Matthew chapter 5. And so point number one is rather simple and that is Jesus says as a matter of fact, if you're citizens in my kingdom, you need to know that you are the salt of the earth. You help preserve this that we call earth. You, you are a faithful remnant Maybe the country or nation or society or the population that you are a part of is still being allowed to live and thrive, maybe because of the influence of you as Christians. And in addition to that, he says we're the salt of the earth and that you help give this old world taste in that sense. Point number two is, is clear from the text. He says in verse number 14, not only are you the salt of the earth, notice he says you are the light of the world. And we already know, I told you this morning this is going to be a simple lesson, but it's, it's an important reminder nonetheless. You are the light of the world. And light has a few purposes, of course. Light is used by God here uh, to transmit His glory to the world, is what He's ultimately saying. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2 for just a moment. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, I want you to observe what Paul writes to the church here. Again, that's Philippians 2, verse 14. I'll give you a moment to turn there. And I love the way this reads, and maybe your translation reads it slightly different. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. He says, Do everything without grumbling and arguing. But notice the next verse. He says, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverse generation among whom you, here's what it says, shine like stars in the world. I love that. I think it's already stated through the scriptures and through our study that the world in the scripture is generally described as a dark and gloomy climate, a dark place. Morally speaking. And what I love about this passage is he reminds us that in this dark world full of sinfulness, we are shining light. We are illuminating light. We are transmitting light. And in essence, we're transmitting the glory of God in the process. They are not, notice, we as citizens of the kingdom, ones who let our light shine, this needs to be stated, we are not shining our own light. The light does not come from us. Go to, with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Here's another passage along these lines. Ephesians 5 in verse number 8. Notice here what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. He says, For you were once darkness. That's significant. Before you were Christians, before you were citizens of the kingdom. But now you are light in the who? In the Lord walk as children of light. Where is the source of our light? That's the question. Ephesians says the source of our light is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in essence, just like the moon does not reflect, the, it, the moon does not contain its own light source, but rather the moon reflects the light of what celestial body? The sun. So we as children of God, we are not shining forth our own light. We too are reflecting the light of the sun. But this is the Son of God, of course, Jesus Christ. And so you see the point beginning to be formed there in the Scriptures. I also love what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12. Go there with me very quickly. In John chapter 8 and verse number 12, here Jesus says something that's profound. Profound. 
Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world, and we will never be in spiritual darkness if we're walking according to His precepts. There's really a twofold responsibility to those of us who are letting our light shine. Number one, it is to be visible. Go back to Matthew chapter 5 and notice this again. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, he says. And then he says this, a city set on a hill cannot be what? Hidden. So the idea of a city set on a hill, that reveals to us that the light we are shining forth, that's truly the light of Christ reflecting off of us, it is to be highly visible. It should be clearly seen. He says this in the next verse. Uh, what is it? Verse number 15. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. No one. There's no use in a light that you're going to hide, but rather a lampstand. You put it on a lampstand. Why? So it can be seen and utilized throughout the entire house or the room. And it gives light for all who are in the house. And so point number one is that our light is to be visible. And obviously that is taught in the Scriptures. You remember in John chapter 13, don't you? In uh, verses 35, he says, he says in verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Uh, and then he says in the next verse, By doing this, all will know that you are what? My disciples. So their love for one another was literally letting the light of Jesus shine. And it was visible to those who witnessed their way of life and the way they treated one another. And it was visible, and we know that because by them seeing that love, they would conclude that these are true disciples of Christ. Here's another point, though. It's in John chapter 17 and verse number 21. We often reference this prayer of Jesus, and we want to talk about unity. And no doubt that's a theme of this prayer. But in John 17, verse 21, the Bible, Jesus says, regarding us, the church, His followers being one, just as He is with the Father. He says in John 17, verse 21, may they, that's you and I, all be one, that is on the same page, united, have spiritual unity. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may know or believe that you have sent me. And so by our love for one another, the world can know that we're true disciples of Christ. By having unity and fellowship with one another, the world can know that the Father really is uh, there. And so I think all of this is interesting. So the first point in light is to be visible. The second purpose of light is to radiate this principle convey, is conveyed by the idea of the lamp in particular. And that is that it is designed to shine on a lampstand, not under a basket or under a bush. Not to put under a basket, that is. This principle especially, explicitly rather, stated is, let your light, in some translations, so shine before men. Let it shine in such a way that, notice verse number 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. That's the visible part. And what should happen as a result of seeing the good works? That they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Why do we do what we do? Here's the point. Here's the application. Why do we come to church services? Why do we worship? Why do we read and study our Bibles? Why are we patient with our fellow man? Why do we love one another? Why are we a family? Why do we give food to the community? Why are we preaching the gospel? Why are we doing anything that we do? And the answer is found at the end of verse 16. And what is the answer? That God may be glorified. That's what it's all about, folks. It's all about that. And Jesus says, my kingdom is coming. In this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount will help us to be faithful citizens of His kingdom. In lesson number one, here's the character you are to possess. And at the tail end of that lesson, here's the way the world is going to treat you, persecute you, but don't retaliate. Rather, in turn, be salt to the earth. Add flavor 
Don't diminish from it. Be the light of the world. Illuminate. And by the way, when the, if the world truly is full of evil and ugliness and sinfulness, and someone shines a light on it, you're going to see the world for the ugliness that it is, right? Satan wants the world to stay in darkness, so I, our eyes will be blinded, and so that people will not see the ugliness of sin for what it is. But when we as Christians shine our light as Christ teaches, and as we teach our young people through that uh, VBS song, though, there are those of the world who will not like that, because your righteousness, and again it's not my righteousness, but your righteousness that comes from your relationship with Christ, it makes me look and feel bad about myself. Expect people to object to that message and that lifestyle. If, if we are truly Christians and we teach and practice the Bible, again, none of us are perfect in this. I fail daily. And no one ever comes to me and objects to the fact that I'm trying to elevate Christ or shine light on a dark world. I'm probably not shining that light very brightly. So in conclusion, the Sermon on the Mount has a lot to offer us. And as he gets started, he just comes out and says, This is the kingdom. It's coming. If you want to be citizens in my kingdom, have this character, the Beatitudes. And again, we could go back through that. Be poor in spirit, mourn over our sins and all of this. And now that you know who you are to be, here's how you're to act. Here's how you're to influence. Here's how you are to shine a light to the earth, to the world. If you're here this evening and want to become a follower of Jesus Christ want to become a Christian and allow Him to add you as a citizen to that kingdom, you're ready for the task. We invite you, as the Lord has done for us all, to come and accept Him. Well, you do that right now with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. But if you're here as a child of God and have wandered away from the safety of God's kingdom, we invite you to come back. Because now is the time that God has given you to make that, crucially, that crucial decision Will you come back to the Lord as we